I couldn't hear you. I'm sorry. Say it again. Uh, this is my time as last. I am sorry you said this. Yes, uh, you are Sarah, Sarah Yusefi. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. You are the. You're going to be your first speaker. I'm going to present you. So. Okay. Uh, I should share my presentation. I'm sorry. I should uh, share my presentation, or do you share yes. it? Yes. Yes, please. Okay. I'm just going to introduce you. This is a, a first session of uh, CS5, Computer Science and Engineering, Architectures and Machine Learning. Our first talk is Any Computing, a Novel Architecture for Orchestrating Various Computing par Paradigms for Adaptive Workload Management, presented by Sarah Yusefi, please go ahead with your presentation and welcome. Okay, can you see my screen? Sure, yes. Okay, can I start? Yes, go ahead, please. Okay, hello everyone, good afternoon. Um, sorry, turn on. Okay. Uh, hello everyone, good afternoon. My name is Sara Yusefi and I will be presenting our work on any computing, a novel architecture for orchestrate various computing paradigms for adaptive workload management. Uh, the presentation content, content includes a introduction on our work, our objective, and a computing system, Excuse some me. key characteristics of late. Well, uh, you yes. may want to uh, uh, put it in your presentation mode. We are seeing the slide on the left side of your presentation. Full screen, you know I mean? Yes. Is it okay now? Going to uh, not yet. Slideshow and presentation. Okay, is uh, it's um, full screen now? You see? Uh, not as a presentation, but uh, but anyway, uh, go on. That's fine. Thank you. Um, sorry, it's right. Okay, the presentation content includes a brief introduction on work, our objective, any computing system, some key characteristics of layers and paradigms, data life cycle, and abstract graph of system, adaptive workload management, illustrative use case. And knowledge management. Uh, the new architecture that we presented uh, under the name of Any Computing is an integrated structure of the deployment of various computing parts in some layers, uh, which I will introduce in more detail. In today's world, where the Internet of Things and Engine system play a crucial role in our daily lives, processing systems with high power and capacity are very important to process and respond to other requests and system, you know, uh, requests of system and object connected to the Internet with different requirements. In this paper, we have integrated many of these emerging processing systems in a single architecture and by adapting a workflow management approach, we guide each computing request in an optimal path and, in, uh, and uh, to a destination that suit it requires. Our objective in developing a unified computing architecture is to establish an infrastructure capable of supporting complex computations 
real-time processing and high um, mobility user premises, which can simultaneously address all the information requirements. So our main contributions are the design uh, of a Teams to Cloud architecture, which encompasses the layers of East, Edge, Fog, and Cloud. Uh, this architecture incorporates a variety of computing paradigms deployed across these layers. And uh, another one is applying a management for, for categorizing requests or pre-processed data based on user and intelligent device requirements. Any computing is some of our integrated computing architecture inspired by the casting routing approach, which is an innovative routing strategy designed to direct data packets uh, to a set of destinations instead of one destination based on some specific criteria. This strategy enhances functionality and improves overall performance. As shown in the image, any computing consists of four main layers MIST, Edge, Fog, and Cloud. Uh, among these layers, we have considered various computing paradigms, which include um, MIST, Edge, Fog, and Cloud. Uh, no, no, sorry. Uh, the paradigms uh, that we consider in this uh, continuous are user premises, Edge node, Fog nodes, Cloudlet, Make, or multi-access edge computing, mobile ad hoc cloud computing, mobile computing, mobile cloud computing, and cloud servers. This layer is a combination of various okay. user premises devices. Me. Uh, we are seeing the first slide. Have you been changing that slide or? Yes. We, we are still seeing the title by of your presentation, uh, we cannot see the other Do you ones. want to uh, share my uh, presentation? I emailed to you my presentation. You share, please. Is there anybody from uh, the, the Congress, uh, the CCE? Uh, there? Yes. Uh, uh, I, I mean, uh, a technical guy from from the CCE Congress. Is there anybody there? Yes, uh, you can show your presentation by the chat, please. Uh, in this chat, it is better. I can't see the attachments icon. Oh. Maybe you can try to you you can try to share your screen and not only your presentation. Uh, I try again, please. Mm -hmm. Please. I share uh, now. Can you see my presentation? Yes. We can. Uh, we can see the first slide. Uh, is it in full screen? We can see only your first slides. Try changing your slides. Yeah. Okay. 
There you yes, are. There you are. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Please continue. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm in uh, a slide six. Yes. Can you see? Uh, we can slide see the four. slide number four. Number four. Now, now six. Now six. Now six. Okay. You may continue, please. Please, thanks. Okay, Kika, characteristics of layers and paradigms in uh, slide six, yes? Yes, that's correct. Uh, MIST layer is a combination of various user premises devices equipped with power source and computational as well as storage capabilities ranging from V to moderate to storage. In the edge layer, the key characteristics of edge nodes are fast response to delay sensitive requirements while maintaining user data security. About the fault layer, the fault layer uh, covers the area of around one hole beyond the object to the cloud layer and includes any computational or storage system ranging from low to high computational power. Key computing paradigms in this uh, layer include cloudlet and multi-access edge computing, which are deployed close to the edge and miss layers. About the cloud layer, also cloud services are wide available. They may not meet the low latency requirements of certain applications, and they are also not very optimal in bandwidth utilization and energy consumption. Cloudlet is sometimes referred to as macro data center or MDC in some studies. The purpose of cloud Cloudlet is offloading computation from user premises to virtual machine-based Cloudlet servers. Uh, Cloudlet, uh, in compared with cloud servers, have a uh, a small scale hardware sizes, sizes and, and, and lower latency energy consumption. Uh, they are accessible through Wi-Fi connection, and Wi-Fi only has local coverage with limited mobility support, so it doesn't have a good quality of service for mobile user equipment. Make or multi-access edge computing it is a platform that offers an IT service environment within radio access network in 4G and 5G near the edge of the network. In make data centers are a small visualization capacity compared with cloud computing available computing resources in make uh, are in a smaller scale and supports the low latency and delay sensitive applications as well as it supports the high mobility devices. Uh, mobile cloud computing uh, combines mobile and cloud computing, uh, by, uh, which uh, shifts mass computations from mobile devices to the cloud, extending battery life and enabling use of intensive applications like mobile augmented reality. While MCC offers greater resource availability, it relies on constant internet connectivity and can introduce latency, making it less idle for delay sensitive applications. Uh, mobile as hoc allows computing or M M M Mac. Uh, Mac enables nearby mobile devices to form a dynamic decentralized network, pulling their computational resources to locally process resource intensive applications without the need for a centralized cloud infrastructure. Uh, Mac utilizing only mobile devices for networking, storage, and computation, also like support mobility and high computational capacity, it faces limitations in managing real-time IoT applications and ensuring trust in the lack of a, a, a structured framework. So, considering the strengths and weaknesses of each 
computing paradigms, we concluded that these paradigms, when considered in isolation, cannot guarantee the fulfillment of the requirements of diverse requests. We define a data life cycle for each request in any uh, in the any computing system for workload management to integrate the data flow from things to the appropriate computational infrastructure. To this end, we have placed brokers in the gateway of the edge and park layers, each equipped with three components designed to identify the requirement of each request. These components execute top tasks to ascertain the needs of the request. As shown in this cell, uh, each subtask is executed by the corresponding component. Data transfer between layers and sublayers occurs via DSL. Mobility detection is handled by the mobility detector component located in the edge broker. Delay sensitivity is defined by the delay requirement component situated in the pipe broker. Resource availability and uh, uh, task progress are monitored by the resource monitor and task monitor, both of uh, which are present in each broker. This figure is an abstract graph of the relationships among the systems components. As you see, the layers have data exchange together by their brokers, and in uh, each broker exists uh, three identifier components for specifying request requirements. Edge broker, as you see, relates to user premises uh, on the one hand and the file broker on the other hand. Similarly, file broker relates uh, to edge broker and cloud gateway. In addition, each broker has the data exchange with uh, the computing nodes of its own layer. Based on the data life cycle for each request, our activity diagram shows a step of sending and processing and the result of the request, which enables adaptive workload management. In this slide, due to the low resolution of the diagram, we show a summary of the activity diagram. Each created task initially uh, preprocessed by the computational unit within the device itself. If the task isn't fully processed in the user premises, it's sent to a powerful computational unit for offloading. At the edge broker, monitoring components assess certain task requirements. If the device is not highly mobile and its required resources are available in edge nodes, the processing is completed at the edge layer and the result is sent back to the device. Uh, however, since the preference uh, is for high mobility device risk processing with MEG, in scenarios with high device mobility or insufficient resources at the edge layer, the task is forwarded from the edge broker to the file broker. The monitoring component assesses whether the task is uh, highly sensitive to delay or if the required resources are less than 70% of the available resources in FART nodes. If these conditions are met, the task is processed on part nodes. Otherwise, the task is forwarded to, to the cloud gateway. And after processing by cloud server, uh, the result is returned to the device. In this picture, we have shown three, uh, three different types of requirements. Uh, the request related to the watching TV uh, has been uh, directed to the cloud layer due to the tolerance of delay and the generation of high volume of data. Uh, the request related to the motorcycle after checking uh, the level of mobility, this request was sent to the park layer and processed by MEC. And fire extinguishing system is processed due to the delay sensitive uh, in the area. In conclusion, it's expected uh, that each request is direct, um, directed to the appropriate destination uh, 
uh, according to its requirements and characteristics. And in the end, I like to express my attitude to uh, my professor, Mr. Sayyid Reza Tarizadeh, for his support. And additionally, I'd like to extend my sincere thanks to the organizing committee of CE 2024 conference for providing me the opportunity to present my work. Thank you for your attention. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, are there any questions? Yes, go ahead. No questions at all? No questions, no, Dr. No okay, well, uh, we appreciate your talk, uh, Sarah. Thank you very much for your presentation. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, our next uh, talk is uh, Hardware Architecture for SHA-3 family in Crystal Kiber, Kiber uh, post-quantum cryptography uh, presented by Adriana Perez Navarro. Please go ahead. Um, good afternoon to everyone. My name is Adriana Perez Navarro. I'm from Simvestar Secretarico, and today I'm going to present a uh, whole work on detailed hardware architecture for Shakti family increase a character for quantum cryptography. The content of this presentation is introductions and uh, Shakti in Kyber, design of results and conclusions. Uh, cryptography uh, aims to protect information and ensure security to the communication. Uh, mo uh, modern cryptography is mainly classified into symmetric cryptography and asymmetric cryptography. In symmetric cryptography, we only have one key, and we have to encrypt and encrypt with the same key. In the problem is how to share the, this key safely. Uh, while in asymmetric cryptography, uh, is designed to solve the problem of the symmetric cryptography. Uh, we have uh, two pairs of keys of related key, one for encryption, one public key for encryption, and another key privates for decryption. RSA and elliptic cover cryptography um, represent the current standards of asymmetric cryptography. They are passing on uh, complex problems that uh, are difficult to solve for a classical computer. Although quantum computers um, are not an immediate danger, but they continue progress, uh, creates a need and Amundsen needs to, to migrate the post-quantum cryptography, uh, to migrate to post-quantum cryptography, is designed to receive both uh, classical and quantum attacks. Um, specifically, the short algorithm when quantum computers uh, have uh, a no uh, numbers of squid of power uh, could run short algorithm and breaks the, the current uh, asymmetric cryptography. It's for that, it's for why that the NIST, the National Institute of Standard and Technology, created a competition to standardize in, in 2017 uh, a key encapsulation, uh, a post quantum cryptography, in order to evaluate. A crypto system for digital signatures and key encapsulation measures. 
Um, according to, to key and calculation, my challenge Crystal Kyber was the winner of the third round of the competition. In the in this slide, we will see an overview of key and calculation measurements. Key and calculation measurements is a cryptography uh, scheme that permit to share the key between two entities to have to communicate. Name it Alice and Bob. Uh, for this, Alice begin running a key is is a key generation algorithm. Uh, and now produce two key, one in calculation key public and another uh, private calculation key. After this, both execute uh, NCAPS algorithms and obtains both copy of the star key with the related cipher, te cipher text and both sends to Alice the cipher text and Alice with the cipher text and the capsulation key, execute the capsulation algorithms and obtains Alice copy of the shared secret key. Now Alice and Bob have the copy of the shared secret, secret key and they can use it for establishing a communication with a um, symmetric key uh, cryptography. If we map the, the key encapsulation key to, to his type <laughs> We have the same three algorithms, key gens, and caps and decaps. All these operations represents uh, are the, the operation <laughs> that Kaiwe uh, implement to execute the, all the scan. In this paper, we focus on the Kaiwe like primitive, no, uh, on the uh, primitive of Chatre family in ke, that use Kaiwe like involved in the, in the dry, diagram. Like chatter, research, and chatter in Kyber, chatter in Kyber. <laughs> Crystal Kyber used four primitives of chatter's family, two hashes and two extendable output functions. Uh, this last this one, in contrast with the hashes, um, the output length is unlimited. For this, uh, we the four primitives use the same uh, spawn function like we can see in the diagram. Um, has this function has an input vector the uh, sixteen uh, hundred bits <laughs> divided in write on capacity is. It is the, la the entry for the permutation and then execute the permutation that we we'll see in the next <laughs> slide. Um, this, function is fun this fun function is divided in, in two, absorbing phase and squeezing phase. Absorbing uh, is uh, for uh, uh, processing all the the entry and squeezing produce the, the output. In the table, we can see all the configuration for the for the four primitive uh, of chat tree in Kyber. Our design, this represents one wrong of the permutation, has a uh, one uh, entry of the text is in uh, the one uh, uh, One number of, of ROM for the four bits that represent the numbers of ROMs and a, a, a ROM constant for 64 bits. That is the, no, the, the constant ROM for which ROM and after that, uh, we execute five steps of transformation and obtain one output on 60, 1600. But complete 
all the permutation is um, we need to, to do uh, 24 rounds. For this, we need to add uh, okay. all modules, like one mod, one register, one constant rounds that um, store all the constants for, for the permutation. Uh, catch up permutation represents um, represent the design we see above and one state machine control permutation. This state machine has three states that is controlled by the world state machine that control all the model. Uh, when this state machine starts with the start drone signal from the world state machine and when it is the state machine finishes send a ready signal to the wall state machine. Check this module is the design, is all designed for the four primitive we implement in for, uh, for crystal kyber. For this, we need to uh, consider uh, absorbing, uh, padding, absorbing, and trunk. For this, add the model pad that consider what kind of primitive is using in this moment. After absorbing the terms and the model trunk uh, get the output of the model. Catch up control represents the world same machine that control all the model. Chatri. Catch up pay is the design we, we see above. Uh, the state machine, this state machine has seven states and control the processing message um, control that all the runs for the for each block and when the when the other when the little state machine sends ready signal it decides if there are another text to processing or if the if produce the hash or results uh, to present a in we implementation result in BS of that language for silent Arctic safety seven and uh, <laughs> feed programmably gate arrive. Or uh, we compare or result in terms of look at tables with plots, slide, and cyclos. With respect to area optimization, our, our work um, represents a balance and result we compare with the literature. With respect to uh, max frequency or result um, is faster uh, than average. If we have cycles, we need uh, 29. That is more than 24 than vision and benchmark, but is less than the meta needs. Conclusion. A balance of the hardware detecting for crystal drivers, cryptographic primitive, optimizing intel of resource and performance is present. The implementation one was performed for driver 768 cryptographic primitive using FPGA with beta data, achieving a competitive balance in the state of the art. The design is integrable, integrable in hardware implementation or in hardware software co designs. The solution is efficient for resource constrained environments, consuming only 10, 50, 55% of loot, 62% of feed plots, and 0.5% of the slide in a cold log FPGA AMD Arctic set. Thank you for your attention. Uh -huh. Thank you for your presentation. Are there any questions? Um, I have a little question now that it's out uh, the the Kyber use the chat transformation exactly or chat transformation? The, the, the sha, yeah, the um, permutation exactly use it because in the in the first slices. You say about the shattering in Kyber, no? Ah, 
Yeah. Yes. Uh, um, so you implement this Shakri permutation in the hardware, no? Uh -huh. I, I start to do you do you think that I don't get it? So thank you. You're welcome. Any more questions? Yeah, I have a question. Yes. Uh, first of all, uh, congratulations for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I would like to know uh, how faster is this implementation in hardware in comparison with a uh, primitive instruction in, in a, a simple process? Mm. We, don't, <laughs> we don't consider this I mean, oh. Zero fire and frequency on cyclos and another. Yes, yes, in frequency. So we, we consider this works. It's so only in hardware and software code is My question is uh, oh, uh, what is the advantage of use hardware uh, instead of a uh, we use uh, x86 architectures, for example. Mm. Uh, well, hardware is most fast and <laughs> all depends on the design. Is this it? Our design is specific for crystal driver. How do you validate your style? Uh, I guess I'm um, I mean, and, uh, yeah. yeah. We compare so, the results of CHA family with the NIST standards. They are, they have um, reference. So the has uh, is the same. Yeah. Ooh. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation. Our next talk is uh, application of machine learning techniques to characterize AI benchmarks okay. using okay. hardware events. Okay. Presented by Victor Manuel Rodriguez Baena. Please go ahead with your presentation. Hello. Uh, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Okay, perfect. Can you see my screen? Yep. Okay. So thank you so much. My name is Victor Rodriguez. In collaboration with Dr. Luis Pisano and Dr. Omar Longoria, we're pursued, uh, we're doing this investigation entitled Application of Machine Learning Techniques to Characterize a Benchmark Using Hardware Events. Um, the presentation overview will be the introduction, the problem description, the hypothesis that we had at the beginning the related work, the, the methodology that we created, conclusions, uh, the results, and the conclusions that we have, right? So, right now, the increase of AI workloads, it's a reality. We live in a world where every day, every month, new applications based on large language models uh, are coexisting across the data centers, right? And those large language models usually are created or trained into large ser server um, farms, which include not only the server um, CPU, but also accelerators for machine learning applications that are based on a specific arithmetic operations, such as floating points uh, um, in a specific. So those kind of accelerators, such as GPU, in data centers for machine learning application are pursuing right now having a big problem. Why? 
because many of these applications fail to fully utilize these resources, resourcing in high energy consumption and performance inefficiency. What does it mean? That regularly, that today, many of the application, they are just deploying on top of the servers uh, as an instance of a software as a service. When they run, the developer of the application of the library, they don't um, are concerned about where the application is going to be running or what kind of accelerators are going to be on top of that. Either if it's going to be a GPU or uh, and the application must offload the, the the compute to the GPU, or even worse, if they if if they recompile this the application or the library to take advantage of new single instruction multiple data uh, instructions that could improve the performance, reduce the number the amount of hours uh, trying to generate the model, and then consume less amount of power to to do the same computation. Now, the complexity of the machine learning frameworks, which is a reality, has been increased as well. It's not the traditional C code or C++ that only execute on top of, as a binary on top of the operating system. Today we have things much more complicated like Kubernetes, containers, and so on that are highly uh, interconnected across each other, which makes the debugging of our performance bottlenecks which much more complicated. So in reality, in, in, in the inefficient use of these accelerators has a significant environmental impact increase in the carbon footprint of AI machine learning application, and identify and optimize the GPU's workloads can reduce the uh, energy consumption, improve performance, and minimize carbon emission. The hypothesis that we have, this research will be focused on creating a model based on machine learning models with hardware performance counters that can efficiently differentiate AI or machine learning workloads in data centers. Uh, by analyzing these AI-specific hardware events, the proposed methods will improve resource allocation and enhance utilization of the machine learning accelerators. And it, they the idea is to optimize the computational efficiency. What are the hardware counters? Uh, it was presented uh, a, year, a year ago by the uh, in CC in, in, in CC 2023 in in Zacatenco. Zacat uh, similar research for the use of um, the hardware counters that for differentiating floating points and integer operations. Basic approach. Now the hardware counters are pieces of hardware that exist in data centers and, and client system as well that counts multiple kind of a specific performance metric. Like for example, how many times the cache was, uh, was trying to access and has some cache data miss or instruction miss or how many cycles for instructions do we have for the specific workload or a specific application, total amount of misses per kilo instruction, last level cache, total amount of percentage of access, misses, and things like that. There are hundreds of those ones. And this, uh, the hypothesis that we have is that by using those kind of metrics, the specific ones, and use of machine learning, we could create a model that helps us to differentiate on runtime between a workload that it's much more heavily on uh, machine learning uh, operations versus one that is not without having the source code. That's important. We don't have the source code for these experiments. So the related work. Uh, previously, there has been work with characterizations in essential for optimizing machine learning uh, processor performance and load balancing. For example, Sivai et al. Uh, created uh, comparing machine learning and non-AI tasks for multi-core system, and they discovered that, for example, Training workloads exhibit higher cache misses and lower core utilization. And they, using the performance metric and event counts, the machine learning models they created were de developed to predict the cycle for instruction. What they uh, was focused not only to differentiate and migrate to the accelerator, but instead predict what would be the cycle for instruction before uh, continue executing the workload. So they don't, didn't care about how to translate one workload to an accelerator to make it faster. They create machine learning models to predict what would be the, the performance in the future of that specific application. The model efficiency distinguished between deep learning and non-deep learning tasks and, and predictive workload, uh, but, but it's not focused on, on how to migrate into the accelerators. On another related works uh, was, was the one that said, okay, we will focus on dynamically migrate workloads because we see that integers and floating points are uh, having a different kind of um, uh, expense into the CPU. They, they degrade the CPU over the time if it's more floating point or more integer field of focus. And it's a great paper, but they do not focus on AI workloads. They only 
focus on uh, floating point and integer. And they do, it was able to differentiate and do the migration, but not for AI work, the, the, the scope was limited. Uh, ben, the, the work that we presented last year, uh, applying principal component analysis and clustering for spec CPU uh, was the, between differentiate uh, integer and floating point, but it was not our scope to actually uh, focus on a AI and non-AI workloads. The methodology that we follow in, in, in this experiment was we have a set of workloads. We don't have the, the source code for that. We run it on top of an Intel C on uh, Platinum uh, 8180, which is, is, is an ice lake uh, system. We collect the hardware performance counter. Then we do the characterization of the workloads with the specific counters, not all the hundreds of those. Uh, and then we apply principal component analysis uh, to do um, dimensional uh, reduce the dimensions because we had four to, to only two, and then use unsupervised machine learning to, uh, which in this case was k-means, to actually make the clusters. And then we measure the, the precision that we have, right? Uh, the performance metric comparison is presented in this table. Uh, the, the performance comparison said, okay, MLC was the first workload to do its memory, um, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a memory stress level cache, workload, right? So it's, it is it is obvious that we'll have high amount of cache misses because of the amount of stress that is presented. The bench the and end in floating point and integer, both are workloads created by Intel to stress uh, with a specific uh, use of vector instruction for x86 architecture and stress things for uh, machine learning for the floating point operation and for the integer operation. And then we have FMPEC, which is a well-known across the industry workload for video coding and decoding uh, on that case. As we can see over here, there is a column that specify how is the, the level of the result compared to the rest of the other ones. For example, FMPEC, it's giving high amount of cache misses of high PC and so on. On the other side, MLC, for example, it's seeing very low branch misses for the CPU. So at the beginning, this information might or might not offer some uh, insight about how to differentiate quickly between machine learning, which is bench DNN, both multi point and integer, versus the other one, which is a memory stress and, and a video coding one. Uh, when we apply the explained variance of workloads hardware, we realize that with two components, it's more than enough to have enough uh, explained vari uh, variation ratio. Uh, three is, is not necessary, so we can go reduce from four dimensions to two dimensions. And the heat map also show a very uh, healthy uh, homogeneous um, representation of the vectors. We, we can see that cache misses in one vector in the principal component one vector, it's very low or has a very low impact, while the other one has a much more impact or relation for that one. So uh, we can see that it's healthy to reduce from four dimensions to two dimensions. Only when, when we do the zoom in and we, we apply this methodology just for the floating, for, for the bench and then floating point and integer, we can see perfectly how it is very well distinguished between uh, floating point and integer just by applying uh, uh, k-means uh, unsupervised machine learning just for these two set of, uh, of, of results. And the centroids are very close to each one of the clusters. So it, it's, it's very, uh, it was very, very interesting to see how well define it, it was the two cluster. Now, when we apply to the rest of the workload, we can see, for example, MLC on green going to the top uh, FMPEC uh, set of execution because we execute many times each one of the workloads uh, was on the other side. And floating point and integer was also in this corner, separated very well from the other one. So at the beginning, it was able to see that with two uh, with just by representing the data uh, and applying basic unsupervised machine learning, it was possible to differentiate very well the, the, the four clusters. Now, this was without using um, uh, some kind of uh, very complicated, it was just k-means and supervised machine learning. Now, the elbow method for optimal number of clusters said, hey, I, I think that you could be using four in a specific uh, cluster. I can see very well four differentiated clusters. Now. The when we said okay, came in separated now into three, we can see that it separates very well between the FMPEG, between sorry, the MLC between the FMPEG and also between the very well defined and machine learning if it's integer or floating point. So, with this, we can conclude that the effectiveness of using unsupervised machine learning, apart from the effectiveness of selecting correctly those metrics, which was the, 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 the similar metrics that was presented for interior and floating point and spec CPU, proved very high efficiency, achieved 100% precision 
in clustering results showing robustness. So we can and uh, we we are conclude we are um, concluding that what was working for floating point and integer was also good to differentiate not only floating point but integer, but to differentiate workloads that are much more database oriented or much more in uh, video decoding oriented from the machine learning and AI models. So consistent findings, it, it was resulting aligned with the previous studies, confirming the utility not only of the unsupervised machine learning, but also that those specific metrics from the hundreds metrics gives very well uh, good result to differentiate the workloads. And future directions, well, we are in the development of a real time for dynamic workload profiling using performance counters. That's what we have. We want to develop a tool that could interface with the operating system scheduler to recommend the use of an accelerator. And when detecting that a workload is good for a accelerator, send it to a specific uh, cluster uh, server that has a proper instructions or, or architecture to accelerate or give better performance. And of course, measure the performance gain by assigning the workload into the specific accelerator and see how much performance do we gain from that uh, smart migration that that's that's the final goal um and that's it so these are my, my reference thank you so much thank you for your presentation uh, questions are there any questions Uh, I have one question. Um, yes. How do you, I mean, what is the process? This is not my area of, of research, but uh, the workload, workload uh, identification is on the fly. For example, if I, if I want to do video coding, uh, it's on the fly, uh, the decision about if I want to use a GPU, or in, increase uh, or improve interprocess communication of cache uh, uh, and misses. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I want to say that, but how is the process performed in in, in reality? Oh, okay. Um, so to 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 answer the question, to the, the experiments that we were um, doing for this research was not on real time. We well, okay. kind of. We execute the workload, and in the meantime, while we execute the workload, we launch another process. Well, the same process is launch another process from in Linux that is perf. Perf is a pro is a program in well established in Linux since many years that gathers for us the performance counters while the application is running. So while the application is running, perf it's counting all these catch misses, uh, IPCs, and so on, and give us back a report. So we start storing those results uh, um, at, at, the, at, the, at the end of the execution of the workload. It's, it, we store that results, and then we feed into the algorithm of, of PCA, k-means, and so on. To, to the, the, the idea of the next tool is to do it in real time. And for that, we need to hack the kernel of Linux to have a separate ser a service that will, when you said, OK, I want to run this workload. And I want to run it through uh, just as, as a regular process into the operating system and leave a service that said, I will be uh, tracking all the process that you enable in a config file. For example, for you, you put it into a config file and you give the permissions to actually uh, to that service to track in real time the perf on, on real time. And then we will feed that into another uh, application that will do this classification and then we'll say, hey, I suggest you that this workload that you have just oh. recently run migrated into the GPU. Do you want to migrate it? Yes, because we don't want to be so intrusive into the operating system. All right, got it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Are there any more questions? There are no well, questions, Doctor. I'm sorry? There are no questions, Doctor. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you, thank you. We're gonna go over our next presentation, which is uh, feature selection using teaching learning based optimization algorithm for classification of remote sensing images. Presented by Ali uh, Loach, I guess.
Yes. Is Ali here? Yes, yes. Oh, please go ahead with uh, with your presentation, please. Okay. How do you say your name? Your last name? Yes. How do you say, how do you pronounce your name, your last name? Al Wash. Yes. Wash. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, I will send you my presentation through uh, the chat, okay? Sure. I will send you my presentation through the chat, okay? And you okay. will. Do you see my presentation? Not, okay, yes, we got it now. We can see it. Doctor, yes, yes. Uh, can you can you hear the presentation? No, I'm not. Um, Ali, we can hear the presentation. You can't hear the presentation. Okay. You can't hear my presentation. We can see I your presentation. Be... Yeah, we can you see can your see presentation. My... Yes. Do you see my presentation? Yes. But what's the problem? You just start your presentation, please. We are waiting for you. <laughs> you can see my presentation? Sure, yes. I have already shared it. I can't see on the... I made the video. I made my presentation as a video. We are seeing the introduction slide. Yes, but what's the problem? I played my presentation through the player, video play. Uh, uh, I'm not sure what you mean by problem. We are seeing your presentation. Yes, but why you have stopped uh, the presentation? Uh, I played, I'm not talking, I, I played my presentation because I prepared it before. Oh, I did not stop it. Is there anybody from uh, technical staff there who did something, who stopped the presentation? I continue to play this presentation? Sure, yes.
we we can hear the the presentation uh, you don't know share the audio yes i share the audio of course but here in in know. the in the session we can hear the volume the, volume, the sound right Uh, your presentation is kind of flickering. It turns on and off. Uh, because it's not a PDF. I prepared it already. Should I uh, restart the presentation with, and uh, uh, with, a, with a PDF? Okay. We are seeing an um, MP4 presentation or what? Yes, yes, MP4, right. Yes, MP4 presentation. Should I restart it? Uh, I don't know what's going on. Um, do we have a PDF? Maybe you can, maybe you can share it by the, by the chat. Can you send it? No, no, I, I, I can't send it by, I cannot send it through the chat. The problem is that I'm sharing the MP, MP4 presentation. So the problem is that the presentation is, is flick, flickering, right? Yes. Do you have a uh, PDF presentation? Yes, I have PDF presentation. Should I Can you share uh, it I, for uh, us? Okay. Instead of the MP4 or video presentation, let's use the PDF file. Okay. Okay, we can see your first slide. went up now we can see your presentation now do you see my presentation no we can no longer see your presentation what about it how about you okay now i'm seeing the first slide the okay, title so slide. I, okay i should uh, start now okay go ahead so good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to my presentation. So I would like to start uh, by introducing myself. I am Ali Alwash from the Algerian Space Agency, and as I work and I work as a permanent researcher at the Center of Space Techniques in Erzu, Algeria. And you can reach me through my email. Today, it's a great pleasure for me to participate in the 21st. International Conference on Electrical Engineering, Computing Science, and Automatic Control 2024. The title of my paper is Feature Selection Using Teaching Learning Based Optimization Algorithm for Classification of Remote Sensing Images. So let's look at the plan of the presentation, which consists of the following parts one introduction, two proposed methodology three experimental results, four conclusions, and five references. One introduction. The volume of remote sensing data sets has considerably increased in recent years and has become an important information source in various fields. However, using the raw data directly may significantly affect the final outcomes because of the features that are redundant, noisy, and not in service inside the hyperspectral high resolution images. To overcome this problem, a feature selection pre-processing step is required. The aim of the feature selection step 
is to find the most pertinent details so as to decrease the data dimensionality, thus saving computation resources and improving the classification accuracy. Any problem? Yes, I have a problem in my computer. I'm facing a problem. Can, can, can you stop my presentation? I have a problem with my computer. And I will, I will present it after fixing the problem. OK? Problem I have uh, my computer is I have problem in okay the TLPU is used in conjunction with the support vector machine classifier to constitute a machine learning paradigm compared to other evolutionary optimization algorithms the proposed TLPU framework is characterized by less computational effort and no algorithm specific parameter requirements. In the end, experimental tests are conducted to show the effectiveness of the proposed TLBO based wrapper feature selection approach by using multispectral data from Earth observing one land imager. Proposed methodology. Figure one describes the main components of the proposed wrapper feature selection approach. In wrapper feature selection, each band of the remote sensing image is converted into a row feature set that is expressed as follows. Row equals what x1, x2, up to x and where n is the number of spectral bands. The number of features is optimized at each iteration by the TLPU algorithm and the SVM classifier with a cross validation accuracy computation. The wrapper feature selection procedure is performed iteratively until the stopping criteria are achieved, then the optimal feature set is used for the classification. The number of features is optimized at each iteration by the TLBU algorithm and the SVM classifier accuracy with a cross validation accuracy computation. The wrapper feature selection is performed iteratively until the stopping criteria are achieved, then the optimal feature set is used for classification. Fitness function evaluation. Always one of the portions disappears from the training as ill as only used to get an empirical estimation of the classification accuracy, whilst the rest P minus one force are explored to run the classifier. After P times of training and accuracy evaluation, the average accuracy gives a prediction of the classification accuracy. In the end, the best value of the, the SVM parameters are fixed as, as such to maximize this prediction and obtain the final estimation of the classification of classifier accuracy. Teacher phase. In this, in this phase, the student with largest fitness function, as we have cross validation accuracy, is considered as the teacher of the class. Meanwhile, the merit of the student in every subject is computed and the value of each student is updated in each subject. The teacher phase is summarized in the following algorithm. Input the initial solution xij, output the new solution yij, begin select the teacher, x teacher of the class. That is the student with the, the highest fitness function, of course. Compute the mean sigma j value of each design variable. Update the value of each student with the teacher, with uh, the teacher x teacher value as follows for i equals one to undo, for j equals one to undo, x prime ij equals x ij plus rij between parentheses x teacher j minus t 
sigma j, where rj is a random number in the interval 0 and 1, and tf is the teaching factor that can be either 1 or 2. And for if f cos x prime i is less than f cos if x i, then y i j equals x i, else y i j equals x prime i, and if and for and. Learner phase in this stage, each student randomly choose another student in the class with whom to interact. However, the, the principle of the TLP of this phase states that the student can learn only from another student who has a higher level of knowledge. The main instructions of the learner phase are summarized in the following algorithm. Learner phase algorithm input the primary solution yij out of the best solution zij begin for i equals one to and two select randomly another student with whom to interact xk where i is different from k if f cost y i is less than f cost y xk then for j equals one to m two y prime i j equals y i j plus r i j between brackets y k j minus y i j and for s for i for j equals 1 to m2, y prime ij equals y ij plus r ij between brackets y ij minus y kj and for and if if f cos y prime i is less than f cos y i then z i equals y i else z i equals y prime i and if and for and termination check all the students that are selected in the learning phase are stored in the memory then evaluated by SBM cross validation accuracy and supplied as new inputs for the upcoming teacher state in the next iteration. The teacher phase and learner phase are executed recurrently until the termination conditions are achieved, which means either the termination criterion epsilon is dissatisfied or the maximum number of iterations is reached. Dataset descriptions. The remote sensing imagery dataset that is used in the present work for the validation of the proposed approach is collected by E1 AD and can be downloaded from the reference aid. E1 Hyperion instrument collects hyperspectral data of 220 spectral bands, while E1 AD collects multispectral images of 10 spectral bands, which are panchromatic, blue one, blue two, green, red, near one, near two, sphere one, sphere two, sphere three, a range from 0.43 micrometer to 2.3. 35 micrometer with 30 meters of spatial resolution. Data sets description. In figure two, the test, da test data is represented in false color as a mixture of three bands, which are green, near, and sphere, to emphasize the interested vegetation class in red, while the binary image represents the ground truth data. The different parameters of the TLB based wrapper features fraction framework are fixed as follows. The number of iterations is limited to 100 iterations. Termination criteria is set to epsilon equals 10 to the power of minus 3. The initial population consists of the 10 spectral bands of A1 added. Concerning the SVM classifier, A2 cross validation is adopted with a cosine kernel function. The performance of the machine learning paradigm is assisted in the matter of overall accuracy, kappa coefficient, and processing time. Comparative results. Figure three shows the classification maps that are generated by using the optimization methods, while figure four displays the evolution of the fitness function according to the number of iterations. Table one summarizes the metric results in terms of the number of iterations, the overall accuracy, kappa coefficient, and the processing time. It should be noted that the raw results are given initially in order to illustrate the performance of the machine learning model before using wrapper feature selection. After that, the result of adopting each optimization uh, method are presented. It can be seen in the convergence graph that GA exhibits the fastest, the fastest convergence, but has the worst results in terms of accuracy due to the perimeter convergence of the chromosomes. The optimal feature sets the optimal features that are obtained by GAR seven spectral bands, which are blue one, blue two, green, red, near one, sphere one, and sphere two. However, this optimal feature set is found not capable to separate the vegetation class in very, very well in the, in the GA map. 
Contrary to GA, it can be seen from the convergence graph that the accuracy of the PSO is, fat, is better. Compared to TLPO, PSO seems to be faster, but it, its accuracy is low. The optimal features that are selected by PSO are four spectral bands, which are blue one, green, near one, and sphere one. This feature set is found useful to separate the vegetation in the, the image as shown by the PSO map, although it can be further improved for obtaining the best results. In comparison to uh, GA and PSO, the convergence graph shows that performance of the TLBO is more interesting because it achieved the highest classification in the results. The optimal feature set that is obtained by TLB contains three spectral bands, which are green, near one, and sweet one. This feature set is the most informative on the vegetation spectral signature. As a result, the superiority of the TLB map comes into view in contrast to the other methods. Conclusion, this paper comes with a new TLBO based wrapper feature selection approach for binary classification of high resolution, high spectral remote sensing images. The TLBO algorithm is used in conjunction with the SVM classifier to optimize the raw feature set. Meanwhile, a cross validation process is performed iteratively to assess the accuracy of the SVM classifier. The comparative results of the experimental tests that, that are conducted using multi spectral data from Iwa Ali demonstrated that the proposed TLBU with the wrapper feature selection framework performs the best in terms of accuracy in contrast to PSO and GA methods that have been adopted by AT. The major characteristics of the proposed TLBU based wrapper feature selection framework are summarized as follows. First, it is robust in, term, in terms of accuracy. Second, it, it is independent of any algorithm specific parameters. Third, it's simple and easy for implementation practice. Fourth, flexible to define new parameters inside the optimization framework. Nevertheless, the runtime consists of the main shortcoming of the TLB algorithm. Therefore, this problem may be tackled in the future by using hyper methods and para computing in order to decrease the processing time of the TLB algorithm. Some further investigations are given as follows. One looking for other optimizations optimization methods that could improve the results of the TLBU to comparing different classifiers and optimizing the SVM parameters in order to achieve the best classification performance. So this is the list, the list of references. So thank you for your attention. Thank you. Um, are there any questions? No question, doctor. Uh, uh, is this algorithm can classify any kind of environment like ocean, continent, forest, land? Uh, it is independent of uh, the image content, or or, or is or or, or is biased to uh, some kind of environment? No, it's independent and can be applied for other types of any any kind of uh, of surface, like the, the land, water, or buildings, or even in the ocean. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we continue with our next talk. Uh, which is uh, enhanced fuzzy inference system for PM10 concentration prediction using genetic algorithms. Uh, presented by Francisco Javier Moreno Vasquez. Yeah, um, let me share my. Uh, can you see me my presentation? Okay. Yes. Okay, um, can you see like moving the, the slides? Sure, yeah. Oh, okay, perfect. Okay, uh, hi everyone. My name is uh, Francisco Moreno. I come from University of Guanajuato. And I'm going to present the paper title uh, Enhanced Fossil Inference System for PM10 
concentration prediction using genetic algorithms. Uh, the outline is quite simple. We only going to explain how the paper was made. And um, first of all, uh, the in introduction, well, the air pollution. In recent decades, uh, studies of the phenomenon of air pollution have taken on great relevance because it's considered a public health problem. Worldwide, about 99% of the population lives in areas where air pollution is above the maximum permissible values, suggested so by the World Health Organization. And more than 4 million deaths per year are associated with poor air quality. Now, there are a lot of pollutants in the air, but we are focusing on particulate matter. And information from the WHO ensures that 9 out of 10 people in the world breathe contaminated air, and the most significant health risk is caused by particulate matter with diameter of less than 10 microns, uh, in this case the PM10, and a diameter of less than 2.5 microns, PM2.5. Well, with this data, uh, the real problem here is the deaths from outdoor air pollution in Mexico. We can see that there is an increase in the deaths the last 10 years. So that's, we are focusing on this uh, like temporal window because the deaths have increased more than the average uh, through the time. And the objective for this uh, research is implement an evolutionary fuzzy inference system that integrates genetic algorithms to optimize the fuzzy rules for predicting the PM10 concentrations. And well, I'm going to explain a little bit the how we get uh, this, this uh, objective. First of all, the story area, which is the metropolitan area of the Valley of Mexico that comprises the Mexican capital and the adjacent municipal municipalities that together form a continuous urban agglomeration. And from all the metropolitan area of the Valley of Mexico, we choose uh, Cuauhtémoc municipality and in especially uh, a station, uh, air quality monitoring station called Hospital General de Mexico, General Hospital of Mexico. And we choose this uh, station for two re reasons. First of all, it's one of the most populated municipalities. And second one, the data in this uh, station is the most complete between, uh, among all the, the stations. So the population and the data availability is quite um, good for, for the research. Or data pre-process um, is to get the information from the internet, from official sources, for, uh, from air quality stations that comes in form of uh, spreadsheets and through Python pipelines. We convert this into readable data, uh, which is, uh, um, or input variables uh, through uh, correlation, analysis of correlation and our target data here is the PM10 concentration, right? All this data is condensed into a hourly database that we filter more and average for monthly data. After that, we clean it and we get our data for this research. Now, some of this theory of this is the fossil logic. The fossil logic is only extends of the normal binary logic that takes values from one to zero. But in this case, the fuzzy logic uh, permits its statements to express partial truth values, such as floating point, point numbers, thereby providing a generalized framework compared to standard logic. So this gives us uh, more opportunities to explore. One of the, of the important keys here in the fossil logic at the membership function, these functions give us that float in point number. And we can see an example of how we use these uh, fossil variables that are, well, the main purpose of the membership function is to convert linguistic variables into fossil variables. And this is the way that we distribute these membership functions through all the values that we get in the data, data set. And the core item here in the research is the fuzzy inference system. This kind of system takes Chris input like a number and through a falsified process doing by a falsifier takes the membership function, 
we choose through a knowledge base and a rule evaluation engine that is a if then rule we're going to see uh, later. Uh, the, we convert discrete input into a fuzzy number that after that we can defossify and get a crisp input that is completely different to the crisp input, but in terms of fuzzy logic. And the optimization technique that we choose uh, is genetic algorithms that is inspired by the process of natural selection and evolution. And these algorithms are particularly useful for sol solving complex problems where traditional methods may struggle. Now, the evolutionary fuzzy inference systems. Okay. Uh, this system integrates the strengths of fuzzy logic and evolutionary algorithms to optimize uh, fuzzy roles, enhance both performance and accuracy. And this hybrid approach utilizes the optimization capabilities of evolutionary algorithms uh, to fine tune the rules of this fuzzy inference system. And I've been talking a lot, a lot of fuzzy roles, but how does the fuzzy roles lo uh, looks like? Well, this is the way that a uh, fuzzy role looks like. We can see like it's like a table where we have our input and our, or when uh, the, the relative humidity and the nitrogen uh, dioxide are or inputs, and the output is a target pollutant, in this case, the PM10, and we can see in each row and column, we have like a prediction of if the minimal of in RH and the minimal of the nitrogen dioxide is in that range or value, then the PM10 predicted value needs to be into the high, range of that linguistic variables into the membership function. And after that, through the defossify process, we can get that crisp output. OK, now the results. We um, use two algorithms to control uh, as, as control algorithms, well-known algorithms of machine learning that I that there are the, the like GBM and the HGBoost. Um, we compare these, these algorithms with our proposed method, and we can see that the results into the errors and the determination coefficient uh, are superior into the, in, in the mixed algorithm that we propose. And this, is, this can be visually seen in this image. Okay, We can see the regression plots for each algorithm, and we can see that the slope in the GI plus fees algorithm is higher than the other ones. So we can conclude, conclude that this approach is good for this uh, type of pollutant. And our, our final conclusions are that the results demonstrate that the GI plus fees model outperformed both SGBoost and light GBM models in terms of accuracy with lower uh, errors and a higher uh, R square uh, coefficient and the GI plus fees model also demonstrates a high slope in the regression plots, indicators of superior alignment with observed data points. And just a, an additional point is that in future research, we would like to explore more optimization te techniques and maybe a little bit of, of techniques in machine model and machine learning models like boosting or mix the GI plus fees with boosting bugging to see if there is a increasing in the performance of this kind of algorithms. Uh, this is uh, the the references and this is all for from my end. Thank you for your presentation. Are there any questions? No question here, Doctor. Okay. Thank you very much for your presentation again. Thank you. Our next and final uh, talk is forward forward algorithm on morphological linear neural networks presented by Gerardo Hernandez. Please go ahead, uh, Gerardo.
Sí. ¿Intenta regresar? No. O oh, así. No, así. Ah. No, ah, eh, creo que está apagado. A ver, pueden revisarle. Eh? Okay. okay. So let's uh, start this presentation. Um, so welcome to to present the forward forward algorithm of morphology and neural networks. So uh, the, the, the authors are Gerardo Hernandez, Alejandro Rodriguez, Maximo Sanchez, and Mari Villafuerte. We are our professors from the Autonomous University of Mexico City, uh, Campus Guptepec. So the content is a, a, a small introduction. Uh, we are going to present the computation units, uh, how to train a multilayer perceptrons with gradient descent, how to train morphological linear networks with gradient descent. Uh, we introduce the forward forward on multilayer perceptrons. And our proposal is to forward forward on uh, morphological linear neural networks and some preliminary results on classification and untangling, untangling and capacity uh, of these networks and conclusions. So uh, we start with the completion units. So uh, the perceptrons uh, performs uh, linear transformations. Uh, performing just uh, multiplication and summations is on the left side. Uh, on the right side, we have the morphological neurons. So these morphological neurons uh, perform uh, operations like maxima and minimum uh, and summation uh, subtraction as well. So these two uh, competition units, uh, um, sorry, so these two competition units uh, are the base uh, from, from all neural networks. So, so the perceptron uh, can be represented graphically as a hyperplane or a line uh, in, in the space, and the morphological neuron can be represented as a hypercube or, or, a, or a box uh, in, in, the, in the space. So these two uh, units can be used to classify patterns in the space. So, uh, when we use perceptrons, uh, we can build uh, multi multi layer perceptrons networks. So, this type of neural networks can be trained with a um, gradient descent. So, to train these um, networks with, with gradient descent, we need two steps. The first is the forward pass, and the second is the backward pass. So, the forward pass uh, consists of inputting the the, the vector vector through the, the the layers of the neural network, and each uh, each layer of the neural network performs a, a transformation. Um, this transformation uh, are composed by multiplications, by, by multiplication and an addition on each layer. So at the end of the layer, and at, in the end of the neural network, we have the classification. Of the input pattern. So that this is the forward pass. The backward pass uh, is propagate the error from the last layer to the first layer. So to do that, we have to know in advance, uh, and this is important, this is important to know in advance the partial derivatives on, on each layer of this uh, the proportional error on each layer. So after knowing uh, the partial derivatives on, on each layer, we're able to obtain the weights and the bias uh, for, for the weights of the neural network. So this is how the train on the multi-layer perceptron is done. So the same, but for morphological neural networks. So this uh, type of neural network can be trained with gradient descent. So the difference is that in the, in the first layer, 
we uh, represented as squares, we have a layer of mor morphological neurons, and in the second layer, we have a layer of perceptrons. So, and this um, can be seen uh, as, a, for example, in the first layer, we have hypercubes, and uh, in the second layer, we have hyperplanes, and uh, we both are used to classify the pattern at the open. So, to train again this uh, morphological neural ne linear neural network, we have to do a forward pass and a backward pass in a similar way. So, uh, in the forward pass for the field layer, we have a DEM activation uh, for, the, for the morphological neurons using maximum and minima. So, uh, 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 in the second layer, we have the activation uh, of the perceptron neurons uh, using uh, multiplication and summations. Uh, and the output, again, we have the, the, the prediction of the layer. So, uh, in the backward pass, uh, again, we have uh, to retropropagate the error from the last layer to the first layer, knowing in, in advance the, the proportional error on each layer for each uh, type of unit, uh, unit so for computation. Units. So, here we have the, the gradients uh, uh, for each layer, for the for the layer and for the for the layer with morphological neurons. So uh, after com uh, uh, completed that calculations, we we are able again to update the weights and the bias. But here we update the perceptron weights and the morphological weights. So this is how the, the neural network work, works. So. Um, we applied the forward forward uh, algorithm on the last uh, type of layers. So we have to know what is the, the forward forward algorithm. So the forward forward algorithm is proposed by Hinton in 2022. And he proposed uh, uh, this simple uh, uh, training algorithm. And he proposed one, the first uh, step, or, or yeah, the first step is uh, to uh, do do two two forwards two, two forwards uh, on on the training set the, the positive forward pass and the negative forward pass of the training set. So the positive forward pass is uh, just like just the training set uh, correctly labeled, and the negative uh, forward pass is uh, forwarding or or inputting the the training set but with incorrect labels. So uh, uh, this is uh, where the, the name of the algorithm comes from, the forward forward algorithm. So this is the, the first step that he proposed. The second step is uh, uh, calculate the activations of the of the of the perceptron of the or, or for the neurons uh, on each layer. So we, we perform the activation of, on, of the, for example, in the first layer using um, multiplication and summations. And after that, on, uh, on the first layer, we calculate the goodness function. So this is the second proposal. So the goodness function is um, how well is doing that layer and classifying the, the data set only on that layer, not the first layer, for example. And after that, we calculate the the loss function or the error function. So we do these three steps on the first layer, and after that we do, we do again or okay, this is these three steps of formulas or values on the second uh, layer, and after that uh, we average the the loss function at, at the end just to, to see how well it's training the the neural network. So. This algorithm is biological, uh, biological plausible because um, we eliminate the the calculate or the calculation of the gradient, uh, and and he uh, proposed this or, or uh, makes his statement uh, comparing the human brain uh, because uh, there is no evidence or no biological evidence. Uh, of this process, the back propagation of, of, on the brain. So we propose this this method, and it's working very well. So we apply this this uh, method 
on our networks, on, on the morphological and the web networks. So we do the same. So we, we apply the positive forward and the negative forward um, um, passes on, 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 our, on our neural networks. And uh, we apply the activation. So in the first layer, we only have a, a layer of morphological neurons and apply the, activ the activation, applying the maxima and minima and the subtractions. Okay. So after that, after calculating the, the activations, we, we do or we calculate the goodness function for that layer. And uh, at the end, we calculate the error of that layer. So these calculations only are for the morphological layer or, or the, first layer, the first layer. So uh, at the second step, and we calculate the, the normal forward forward on the second layer because this is a perceptron layer. So we, we calculate the activations, we calculate the goodness function, and we calculate the log or, or the error function uh, for that layer. Uh, and at the end, we use average the, the errors for, 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 that, uh, for all the layers. And that's, the, that's how uh, the neural network works. So it's important to, to notice that when you work with a, a networks with two layers uh, for the original algorithm and for our proposal, and this is because we were having troubles over this is the, the next step of our research uh, of stacking uh, several uh, morphological layers. So uh, that's why because uh, we only work with, with two layers on the original algorithm and in our proposal. So, uh, preliminary classification results, uh, this is the, the simplest X or problem. So, we can see that our, our neural network performs a, a, a good classification of the patterns. So, the important thing here to notice here is that um, these surfaces are closed. This of a So this is a, a characteristic that just characteristic generated from the morphological neurons. So it doesn't matter if we use uh, the gradient descent or we use the forward-forward algorithm to try in this type of neural networks. We obtain the same, the same uh, surface, or well, not the same, similar surfaces, closed surfaces. So on the right side, we can see that the the training or the losses for, for this uh, type of training are working well. They're in red, the, the morphological loss, and in uh, green, the dense loss. So, increasing the complexity of the training, uh, we use a, a movie review data set. So, this is a big data set. So, to, to classify uh, this data set, we process the information of the data set with a word to bet uh, uh, algorithm to generate 100 length factor vector. So uh, we treat this um, classification problem as a binary classification. We classify, uh, we classify uh, positive or negative reviews only. And um, the results of the classification problem is that we only uh, work to or classification is works in only two two points, so it's okay because uh, we are comparing with uh, the original algorithm, the, the forward forward on multilayer perceptrons. The problem here uh, we notice is that the dendron loss is having trouble, and the red line is having trouble to to classify or to do the, the work on the classification tasks. Mm, uh, um, on the other side, the red line is the dense uh, loss or, or, or the, the work that is done with the perceptual layer. So we are having trouble. So we are working on, on this, but we are this this or uh, or pre preliminary results. So this two were or oh, this work from from the classification perspective. So uh, talking about the entangling capacity, we use uh, the classification spiral, uh, spiral classification data set. So this is a well-known data set that is uh, consists from of one, one or two or n spirals. For example, this, this are a data set of two classes. 
one in orange and one in blue, and from one spiral, two spiral, to five spirals. So, um, and in the first row, we have the results of the, the forward forward multilayer perceptrons. And in the second row, we have the forward forward of morphologia or 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 proposal. So we can see that both uh, uh, architectures are having trouble to classify to classify. Sorry, uh, in in a good manner in a, in a good way. The the this data, this data set. So. Uh, when more uh, complex is the, is the entanglement of the data sets, more difficult to, to this algorithm. And for this algorithm, I refer to the forward forward algorithm to classify this. So um, uh, I, I say that because uh, this data set with uh, the gradient descent are perfectly classified. So this is another uh, analysis that we done with these uh, neural networks. So, well, in conclusion, uh, we demonstrated that the forward forward training algorithm is applicable to different types of neural networks, and for example, or proposed and morphological in linear neural network. And just like the, the, the original uh, uh, architecture, the forward forward morphological linears offer uh, another biological plausible alternative to backpropagation training. And of course, we need to improve uh, the disentangling uh, results in complex patterns. And as a future work, uh, we propose to modify the goodness function, um, explore adapt adaptive threshold. Uh, the, the, the threshold is a hyperparameter of the forward forward algorithm, like a, uh, like a latent rate for, for the gradient descent. And uh, well, stack more layers of morphological linear, linear of morphological neurons. Sorry, uh, we'll see what happens. So this is uh, our proposal and our presentation. And uh, well, thank you. Are there any questions? No question here, doctor. Okay, thank you very much again for your presentation. And that was uh, our final presentation of the day of the CS uh, session. Thank you very much. Hope to see you again next year. <laughs> thank you, doctor. Thank you. Bye.